Good afternoon. I'm Michelle Williams, Dean of the Faculty here at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We're thrilled to present program number two in our series, When Public Health Means Business, a series developed in partnership with the New England Journal of Medicine, a partnership with shared intentions of bringing together the best in science, research, clinical relevance, and policy translation. Almost four months into the COVID-19 pandemic, we all continue to struggle. The World Health Organization reports the number of new cases rising daily worldwide has hit a new high, even as we are all seeing businesses reopen. As The Atlantic put it so perfectly, the virus isn't done with us yet. At the same moment, we are all now facing a global reckoning around police brutality and systemic racism. Black and brown people are showing the world the deep wounds we carry, the frustration, the sadness, the trauma, as well as the pain that comes with being black in America. And as those of us in public health know, these two moments cannot be viewed in isolation. Even before the murder of George Floyd, the COVID-19 pandemic was forcing us all to confront yet again our country's ingrained racism and the way in which it fuels unequal health outcomes. The social movement that is now unfolding is a broader call to action it is a call to action that demands that we confront all of the ways that systemic racism harms black people in this country. I recognize that it's quite a lot to cope with. Believe me, I do. But we must engage fully to address this problem of racism. Not doing so will simply tear us all further apart. COVID-19 may have literally distanced us, but this current moment demands that we come together and engage in deeper dialogue around racial inequality in all its forms. This moment demands that we make radical new investments in public health and that we make these investments in order to enact meaningful systemic and durable change. So here we are today at the crossroads of business and public health. Last week, you heard us talk about these strange bedfellows. Well, not anymore. The rigors of science and health must take equal priority to profit and wealth. It is clear now more than ever that we must invest equally in building both economic and social capital. Public health and business must engage in order for both the economy and society, and I mean all society, to be able to thrive well after COVID-19 pandemic. Public health's time is now, and today I'm honored that we can continue this conversation. Before I begin, I do want to acknowledge that today is shutdown STEM, a challenge to academia and STEM, asking that our fields pause and consider the work we must together do to eradicate anti-Black racism. While this call to action is aimed at the broader research community and is not in any way meant to delay the urgent work being done around COVID-19 response, just as we are doing here today, I applaud and support this call to action. There's no doubt that our academic and scientific communities need to do much more to become more inclusive and to become more supportive communities. So please help me welcome our special moderator for today, Melissa Lee. Melissa is host of Fast Money, and Options Action, 
both on CNBC. Melissa, before I turn it over to you, let me take a moment and welcome you back, at least virtually, to our Harvard campus, your old stomping grounds. Over to you, and thanks again for being here. Thank you so much, Dean Williams. It's a pleasure to be with you all today to discuss such important topics during such a critical time in our society. Um, it is great to be back at the Harvard campus. Someday I will physically be back, I guarantee that. <laughs> Uh, and hopefully, uh, with the help of public health, that time will be much sooner than, than we think right now. Now, remember last week, Dean Williams kicked off this multi-part series, making the case for why public health means business. As a pandemic steals lives, as a senseless killing of George Floyd spotlights a public health crisis of racism, as millions of Americans remain out of work, even as others return to the job force, perhaps worried about staying safe from the coronavirus. Dean Williams and the panelists described a clear need for unprecedented cooperation with public health and business to steer the runway for our economy and our society to reopen and to thrive. Today, we've got a lot uh, of work to do. We're here to talk about who will define the future of public health. We'll talk about what it will take to reopen the country safely, what are businesses doing already, the role of public health in all of this, and what more needs to be done. Uh, so let's get right to it. Joining us today, Nick Pinchuk, the chairman and board of the board and the CEO of SnapOn, Arnie Epstein, the John H. Foster Professor of Health Policy and Management, also the Senior Academic Advisor to the Dean and the Chair of the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Chan School of Public Health, as well as the Associate Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. Mandel Crawley is also here, Head of Private Wealth Management at Morgan Stanley. Peggy Hamburg joins us as well, Foreign Secretary of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine, former commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and former commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And Eric Rubin, editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine, Irene Hines, given professor of immunology and infectious diseases at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and a physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Um, we're going to let the panelists share some of their top line thoughts first, and then we want to have a broader discussion. We also encourage all of you out there who have joined us uh, during this event on Zoom, you can submit your questions here. You can also email them uh, to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. We do encourage you to send us questions because we want this to be a true conversation with the panelists and you out there in the community. But let's kick it off with some of these top line thoughts. Um, Nick, you've been the CEO of Snap-on for quite some time. You, you, you know, you've been in the CEO suite. I would imagine that this is the first time the public health has really taken um, a spot front of mind so persistently during this pandemic. Can you explain to us how you think about public health today uh, when it relates to your business as opposed to before the pandemic? Sure. Uh, uh, nice to see you, Melissa. Nice to see you again, and it's my privilege to be here. Look, um, during this virus, it becomes clear. The dependence of society on frontline working men and women has never been more evident. The need to keep them safe has never been more urgent. And I think the essential role of public health in, in that task has never been clearer. In fact, if you're in public health, as, as the Dean said, this is your time. Just a brief thought about where I come from, you know, Snap-on's a manufacturing company and we never actually closed because what we do is, is essential. And we deal, I have a number of man, uh, manufacturing facilities, but we also deal with garages and working men around the world as uh, world and the United States as our customers. I just came back from visiting factories and those people. And here's what it is. Those people are vigilant, but they're proud because they see themselves as participating in a war. Uh, providing for the common defense against uh, an ancient foe, you know, like communicable disease. And, and what you see out of that is that it's kind of interesting. I think ironic that truck drivers, uh, uh, grocery store clerks, uh, repair shop technicians, a factory workers, the people we often view as having settled for the consolation prize of our society are the people we turn to when the days are the darkest. And if you're in business, these people, despite what some people might think, the safety of those people is one of our paramount views. It's our responsibility. At Snap-on, 
every meeting we have, the first thing we discuss is safety. But the safety there was quite limited to the idea of occupational hazards. This has changed everything. You know, I guess we thought that a world that landed, uh, put boots on the moon more than 50 years ago and gave us the iPhone and, uh, and maybe was raising artificial intelligence would be able to squash things like this ancient foe uh, uh, very quickly. But uh, technology did not deliver us from evil. And we needed to have tactics like sheltering in place, uh, uh, distancing, wearing masks, contact tracing. And so going forward, businesses are gonna look at that and expand the idea of safety, saying, how are we gonna keep our people safe? What protocols we need, do we need? And public health plays a big role in that. So I see the idea of public health getting together with business to create the protocols that defend us from these, these I guess, communicable diseases or broader safety concerns going forward as an important component for any business. And this is the time to do it. Right. You know, I don't, I don't know if public health was ever viewed as, as a essential in terms of value creation for shareholders as it is right now. Right now, it's absolutely part of it. Um, and Arnie, I'm, I'm wondering how public health can sort of capitalize on that and whether you, you believe that this sort of partnership will, will remain well past the pandemic. I'll try to answer that, but first let me welcome you back to Harvard. We love, we love our alumni and <laughs> glad you're visiting us. Uh, thank you for joining. I'm gonna really just make three points that have to do with public health meeting business. Um, the first is this, the not so surprising idea that US public health right now hasn't done that good a job in this pandemic. In fact, some people think it's absolutely problematic. Think of the numbers. We've got less than 5% of the world's population. We've got 30% of the COVID-19 infections and a commensurate proportion of deaths. That's not very good at all. We've known since the beginning that testing was going to be integral. And the word came out and said, don't worry, we'll have it for you soon. But they didn't have it for us soon. And when they eventually got it, it's still not enough. And Washington, the leadership there, has been inconsistent across, just inconsistent. And here's one we can't blame on them. It's an American people thing. We distrust our government, and as a result of that, in part, public health is chronically underfunded. And so the first takeaway is that when I think about public health meaning business, yes, it means working businesses like we just discussed, but it means business in another way. We've got to clean up our act and clean our business and be all we can be. Second point I want to make is that it's been difficult for public health and business to partner when there's lack of full information. Take uh, the things that we can do to produce safety, Myriad, uh, PP&E, which includes uh, gloves and masks and gowns. We can do hand washing. We can do uh, avoid large meetings. We can do telework. We can do all kinds of different things, literally numbers, and yet, each of those different strategies has personal and monetary costs, but we often don't know them. We should be the ones who are able to go to this business and give them a menu, a medley of things that they could do and assure them, here are the four things that are most effective in your setting and cost effective as well. The third point I wanna make is almost a corollary to the second, which is that COVID-19 isn't just a fire, it's a conflagration. In three months, we've lost 100,000 Americans. In three months, the unemployment rate has gone from 3.5% to over 14%. That kind of clinical and economic carnage has an impact. And so at the bedside, we see doctors acting as one IED specialist, and I would put it, as like the Wild West because they didn't have information from randomized trials to make good decisions. And I know we're all waiting for additional therapies and a, certainly a vaccine, but when that vaccine comes, it's gonna bring great relief to many and trepidation to many others 
who will worry about the side effects and the downside. And if you move from the individual person to the system, we should be the one who's telling the states how to open, when to open, and, and so forth. But we don't really have that role. So I think it's going to be important, maybe critical, for all of us, public health experts, scientists, business types, to work together to come up a way so that the next iteration of public health working with business is even more su successful. Why don't I stop there? <laughs> Peggy, I know that you had some thoughts about the vaccine. And, and all the different information that we've we've heard uh, from various about uh, the time frame for a vaccine or time frames for treatment. I mean, all those all of that information goes to decisions on how quickly we should reopen and how we should reopen. So, going back to Arnie's point, how how can that partnership between uh, public health officials and businesses be strengthened as we chart our course forward? Well, thank you so much for the question and thank you uh, to the uh, Harvard School of Public Health for including me on this important panel. You know, I feel very strongly that public health will guide us to a better, safer world and out of this COVID crisis. It will help us to save lives and to restore the economy. And that we, we do have a unique opportunity as we go forward dealing with the coronavirus, but also um, dealing with whatever the future may bring to develop those kinds of partnerships that Arnie was just referring to. It is true that the public health response to our current crisis has not been what all of us would have hoped for, would have expected, to be honest, um, because you know our Centers for Disease Control and our state and local health departments are some of you know, the best and brightest um, and most experienced in public health and public health preparedness. But I think we also have to recognize that public health has been, you know, frankly, underappreciated, if not shunned by many sectors, um, including government, over far too long. There have been improvements since I was health commissioner in New York City but still far more money is spent on clinical care than on public health. Between 2008 and 2017, health departments at the local level saw their budgets um, cut by more than a quarter and 50,000 workers um, were lost. So we came into COVID-19 not as well equipped as we had been and as we should be. And I think that there is a a renewed appreciation about the importance of public health and we have to build on that, but public health must be visible. We must speak clearly. We must offer um, the best possible science for decision-making. We have to be trustworthy and we have to be, of course, uh, committed in a sustained way, just as all of our partners have to be committed to public health in a sustained way. So I just you know, do feel that we have to put that on the table as we look at why public health has not delivered as one might have hoped and expected in this crisis, because you know, public health has had a long, um, history of being the poor stepsister. When public health is successful, it is preventing problems from occurring and people don't appreciate it. In terms of the issues around public health and science and the need for the, the right set of tools to help us uh, support the needs of, of business and our economy and to support the needs of individuals and communities, um, I think that we really have, again, a remarkable opportunity. Uh, the science is moving forward very, very swiftly, and we've seen the kind of engagement across um, sectors and across borders necessary to really mobilize to develop vaccines, to develop um, new therapeutics. Uh, and you know, hopefully also to continue to develop new, better diagnostic tests, which has been part of the problem, of course, in the uh, delays in the response. Um, but as we do that, we have to be very uh, sure that we communicate clearly about what the science is, 
what we need to do, why we need to do it, and particularly when it comes to vaccines, that trust in the research and development process, as well as in um, the ability of all those in need to access it is going to be absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. A couple of themes have emerged, Mandel, in terms of public health and business, and that is the information that businesses are getting to, to sort of guide their decisions on reopening, and also this notion of investment, investment in ta of time, investment of effort, investment of money in public health and health efforts. So Mandel, I'm, I'm just wondering what your take is. Uh, you deal with a lot of clients, high net worth clients, um, who are investing their money in health in, in some ways, and in a business that is investing in their employees and the health of their employees. Sure. No, thanks, Melissa. It's, it's good to be uh, with all of uh, with all of you. I, I, like I think the uh, my partners here on the panel have uh, uh, have really made out um, some really good uh, points. Frankly, I could probably listen to them all day. I mean, as a as the business guy that's here, I mean, there was a point in time where when you asked me the responsibility of of Morgan Stanley and using Morgan Stanley as a proxy for financial institutions, I'd simply say we advise originate trade, manage, and distribute capital. We do it for uh, governments, individuals, and for, um, um, uh, for institutions, and we, and, and we try to do it with a standard of, of excellence. But the reality is, um, you know, we all have a role to play. I think Peggy uh, said uh, this incredibly well, and, and clearly the current environment has never made that more clear. We have over 90% of our employees globally working Remotely, and in, in, in Asia, in Europe, uh, they're probably a little bit ahead of ahead of the U.S. in terms of we're starting to leg back. We want to be smart and thoughtful about how we do it, but it's never been more acutely uh, obvious to us uh, that we have to do more. I think the CEO uh, business roundtable uh, announced. I forget if it was late. I think it was late last year when they said that. Uh, the responsibility of corporations uh, is much higher. It's much greater. It goes beyond just delivering value for, sh value for shareholders. I know that there are some um, uh, our, uh, Milton Friedman followers that are out there that probably bristle at the fact, but without question, we have more to do. And, and so when I think about our job and our role in the capital markets, we're a business that obviously is entirely dependent upon human capital. In a final analysis, we are a relationship-based, talent-driven organization. If you don't have the health and wellness of your employees, um, you know, none of the other stuff uh, matters. And more specifically, you know, when Peggy was talking a bit about science and how fast science is moving, I can't help but think about the role that we play uh, in innovation. And I'm, I always say that, you know, in order to have innovation, clearly that starts with brain power. That starts with the idea. The idea is essential. But I would argue that the idea on its own is insufficient. You need capital in order to scale it. And that's the, the business that we're in. And when, when I think about some of our capability, you know, just from a purely investment banking perspective, the two areas that have been most vibrant for us over the last number of years has been technology and it's been healthcare. And so there's a clear role for us to play. We, uh, we are up for the challenge. There's a number of other things that maybe I'll talk about a little bit later in terms of what we're doing specifically and on an idiosyncratic basis. But, um, you know, it's, it's good to be here and I'm fascinated by this topic and Clearly, we operate at the intersection of business and, and public health. So I'll pass it back to you, Melissa. Thank you. All right. Um, let's get to Eric now. Um, Eric, I'm, I'm curious, as you know, the head of the New England Journal of Medicine, it's, it's funny because you can go to a virtual cocktail hour on Zoom, of course, <laughs> and uh, it, it wouldn't be unusual for somebody, a layperson, to say, you know, I read this article in the New England Journal of Medicine about this trial. Um, and, and so everybody is sort of this armchair doctor these days. What do you make of the, all the information that is out there and how business leaders are expected to navigate all of this um, and answer questions from employees who may be doing the same uh, at a time when, when society wants to get back to work? Well, I, first, Melissa, I, I think maybe you need to go to a better quality cocktail hour. <laughs> I, I, I think that in the business of communications, of science and medical communications, um, it's a challenging time and a time of opportunity. I think there, when you talk about communicating information, you're talking about a lot of different audiences. Uh, there's Arnie and, and Peggy who are going to be looking for technical information, the kind that we provide. Um, there's Nick, there's Mandel, they're looking for 
practical information. What is this going to mean? What, what does the latest research mean? And how is that going to make, have an impact on my business? Um, um, and how do we get that out there in a way that we want? And, and then we have other communities. We have uh, 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 Nick's employees, all of whom have been working, you know, cheek by jowl in the factory. And, um, and we want to keep them safe. I think in, you know, today we can't help but mention that it's minority communities that are disproportionately affected by this disease, and they're going to get their information in other ways. So how do we do that? Um, I think there are a couple of things. I think we're a medical journal, and we have tried to do our best to balance speed, getting the message out there quickly, and reliability, um, to try to maintain the trust that people put in us by trying to do the best job we can. Um, and, and that is rather challenging, but it's, it's, it's what we know how to do, um, even if we don't know how to do it so quickly. Uh, uh, we're, st we're still working on that. Um, I think that we use the uh, media to communicate through. Um, and Melissa, you and your colleagues are incredibly important to us because we're not communicating directly with, uh, with the lay public. We need interpreters. The important part of the message, though, is the most difficult part of the message. It's not whether or not this drug got tested. It's not exactly what the outcome of that test was. It's the degree of uncertainty that is in the, um, the results. It's how, how reliable are these results? And the answer is there's always some degree of uncertainty. And uh, it's not an easy concept to communicate. Um, and I think that it's on all of us to try to do the best job that we can of that. Otherwise, we lose trust. Otherwise, people are going to say, well, you said that last week, and now you said this. We've had occasions and recently with the WHO statement the other day um, that uh, where they, uh, they backtracked, and it, it looked like they didn't know what they were saying, um, even though they were just not communicating clearly. So I think it's, it's really on us to communicate that difficult concept that we're not sure about things. Thanks. All good points here. We, we do want to dig deeper into some of these topics that were touched upon by our panelists during the opening remarks. But before we do, we do want to remind our audience that this event is part of an ongoing series presented jointly by the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the New England Journal of Medicine and hosted by the forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Um, we also want to remind viewers that that you can send your questions in on Zoom or you can email them to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. But we do want to dig deeper now. Um, and I'll, I'll kick it off with the business leaders here on our panel, Nick and Mendel, um, in terms of public health and creating shareholder value. Uh, Nick, obviously, right now, those two go hand in hand. And I'm curious, your perspective, just to sort of dovetail on, on some of the comments made by our public health panelists in terms of navigating information. Um, how, how are you navigating that information? Who are you leaning on? Because public health these days has a direct impact on how you run your business and how you create uh, wealth for your shareholders. Yeah, we're, we're, we're of course leaning on through our safety people, uh, the CDC and the WHO and so on, anything we get our hands on to try to guide ourselves. But let me just try to correct a few things. I think, look, I think, uh, Businesses today serve multiple constituencies. You know, at Snap-on, we of course need to, need to have the confidence of our shareholders, but we need the faith of our customers and the commitment of our employees and the support of our communities. And in fact, even the hope of our retirees because they depend on us for their, uh, their pension funds. You know, so you look at that. And then one of the things about it, I, I have a lot of energy about this. When people think of factories, they tend to think of some sort of scene from Silas Marner. And that really isn't the way factories are today. They are very advanced and you can eat off the floor. And our factories, people are not working cheek to jowl. <laughs> They're pretty far apart. And I can tell you Sorry this, about that. that, you know, we are in the human capital business. And one of the disadvantages of saying that your people is, are important is if you're a CEO, you realize that on occasion you have to act like it, you know? And so part of that is, is, is taking care of their safety. So I would suggest that any communication from the public health organizations, from, from, from the Harvard School of Public Health, would be quite welcome from, uh, from the uh, business community from sea to shining sea here, because we're all looking for guidance going forward. We've been quite shocked 
by the effect of this, even though we've stayed open and the effort we've had to put in to keep our people safe and we've worked very hard to do it, but we could use some help and we're receptive to it. I'm curious, Nick, uh, just in terms of some of the changes to how you do run your factories, what are, what are a couple of the, the changes you've made to keep your employees safe? Well, one of the things is we certainly want to make sure that they've, you know, kind of like the tactical things. Actually, in our factories, people were distanced to begin with. One person runs four machines, so there are 25 people feet apart, and there's a lot of metal in between them. But, you know, those people who couldn't stay safe, we used PPE. We, we cre- even in that situation, we created a situation where if people felt like they were uncomfortable, and there were some of those, they could go home, take vacation, or, or not show up and not have any penalty and have their job when they felt like they wanted to come back. And then we did some, tried to do what, we, what passes in a manufacturing environment as contact tracing. We tried to make sure that anybody who showed symptoms or anybody who tested positively, we worked very assiduously to find out who they met and then send those people home and pay them for two weeks quarantine. And that worked for us really. We had cases but very few cases uh, multiplied in our factories. And in fact, I'm happy to say all our cases are out of, out of danger now. So I'm feeling reasonably good at this point. That's great to hear. Uh, Mandel, in terms of uh, your business, I would imagine that um, you mentioned before that most of your staff, many of your staff are working from home. Um, How long do you think that will persist for? And and how are you leaning on public health officials to guide you as to when to bring employees back? I'm especially uh, curious as to some of the states where, where it's creeping towards reopening versus a state or an area like New York City, which is um, still in its early, early, early stages and, and how you're sort of catering the reopening to different regions of the country. Yeah, no, thanks for the question. I mean, it's, it's, it's the obvious answer is it's uneven around the world. Uh, I mentioned uh, earlier, we probably have 45% of our employees uh, back in the building in Hong Kong and in the, the greater uh, China region. Um, Japan has had a, a, a bit more of uh, a, a challenge. London, uh, I think we've got 10, 15% of our employees uh, back in the workplace and we'll continue to stage um, um, various cohorts of talent based on how essential they are in terms of how you know, their need to be proximate to um, uh, the building. Uh, New York City will likely be last on that list. And as you mentioned, Melissa, here in the U.S., uh, our wealth management business, we've got 600 branches out across the country. 97% of those employees are working uh, remotely. And if you had mentioned that to, to me or anybody on our leadership team uh, weeks uh, in advance of the COVID crisis, we would have thought that this was just simply impossible. Thank goodness we've had uh, the, the, the scale and the infrastructure to be able to invest in our tech stack uh, so that we were able to pull it off. But um, it's, been, it's been incredible. But part, parts of the country in the Southeast West Coast, uh, likely to have uh, higher percentages of employees go back uh, to work. But we've made it very clear to all of our employees, no one has to return until uh, they're ready. Uh, I was extraordinarily proud of our CEO for being uh, early in making the point that uh, everyone's jobs would be uh, protected. uh, So no one was going to lose their job as a result of that. And again, it was quite helpful for us to be in a position of strength to be able to make that declaration early on. And we've done some other things that, frankly, I think have made, you know, we were more or less lucky. Uh, one tactical example of that is we hired our first uh, chief medical officer, first time ever. We had never had uh, that position in our firm, and that hire was made at the end of uh, 2018. And get this, his name is Dr. Uh, David Stark, who uh, has his degree, he got his degree, medical degree from Harvard. Uh, but when you think of that name, you immediately think of Iron Man. So we all have a great deal of comfort. Uh, you know, having uh, uh, David on our, our, on our leadership team. And, and as Nick mentioned, David and his team working very closely with the CDC, state officials, et cetera, and taking their guidance and cue, uh, you know, from the uh, public health uh, officials. But I will tell you our appreciation uh, for our partners in public health has never been higher because these are the types of things you just simply take uh, for granted. And there are other things that we've done tactically uh, as it relates to our philanthropic efforts uh, or what have you, um, because we know, again, we have more to do and we should do uh, as a result of all of this. I'll, I'll stop there. 
Arnie, there, there are so many different issues involved with the reopening, not just bringing employees back, but making sure the buildings are safe, the ventilation systems are, are safe, um, all, all things that public health can help with. Um, and it's interesting that Mandel had mentioned the hiring of a chief medical officer at a bank. Um, and I would imagine that this is going to be more of a trend across industries to have somebody on staff who is the expert in public health to advise companies on how to do things safely for their employees and for the communities they serve. I think that's likely to be a trend we're likely to see. There has been talk about various firms hiring a, a chief public health officer for that. And when you think uh, that this disease is likely not going away anytime soon, the ability to function is gonna depend critically on two things. Can an employer really ensure that his employees will be safe in the workplace? And can he, that employer assure customers that they will be safe? Because without that, I don't think we're gonna see much business taking off. Peggy, do you think that that will be, I mean, I would imagine that that's gonna be a real benefit to businesses, it's a challenge. Um, for public health to communicate. I mean, if information is difficult now, imagine having um, all of these different silos across the country advising their own workforces on how, how to run things and how to operate. Um, there is, it's gonna be difficult, I would think, to communicate a message to people, a consistent one. Well, I think it is very, very important that public health agencies like the Centers for Disease Control, you know, really are out in front providing important public health information across a whole range of issues. It's of course not just COVID-19, although right now that's front and center, offering uh, guidelines, offering uh, access to additional information, in some cases offering technical assistance. And you know that has, has historically um, happened to a greater or lesser degree. And it has been very, very valuable. And, the World Health Organization can serve that same function on a global scale as they are the only health uh, agency that exists that has membership of almost every country in the world. Um, but I do think that it's appropriate. I'm in fact surprised that Morgan Stanley didn't have a medical advisor earlier because they operate around the world. They need to think about how to ensure the health and safety of their employees. And it, it may be things as, as minor as, you know, whether they're having an adequate um, set of vaccinations to go work in a certain area, or it may be trying to assess the risk of, of some kind of a health problem that is, is uh, in a given region. But, but many companies, you know, have wanted to have some kind of uh, medical public health advisory uh, system because of either workplace health and safety issues like Nick um, was talking about earlier, occupational health and safety, or these issues of having uh, employees that are moving around the world. I think the more we can continue to have these conversations, the more we can build on this moment when the importance of these connections and open communication is very powerfully felt, um, the better we will do going forward. But I think it, it, it does require a recognition about how public health contributes to health, safety, well-being, and ultimately to economic productivity. Um, not to mention our national and international security. So this is, as Dean Williams said at the very beginning, the time for public health in terms of really um, sort of defining what it is, how it works and why it matters and then delivering on that message. So this is a real moment in time for public health, Eric. I mean, this is the opportunity, right, to, to say this is what we do, this is how we can help. And I think people have already acknowledged that public health has helped. I mean, it's been instrumental in guiding the way towards the reopening that we have been seeing. What more do you think public health should do in terms of defining itself and, uh, you know, making sure that it, it will remain side by side with business well beyond the pandemic. I mean, what we've seen in the past with past pandemics is that there is a, a acute interest in things when when a disease is still you know infectious and, and raging out there, MERS and SARS, and then after that, it, it just drops off. 
and it can't drop off. That, that was the problem here, right? <laughs> Interest drops off and then people get too relaxed. I, I think that's true. Um, and um, I think that there are a couple of things that could help with that. Um, first off, um, just to follow up on what Peggy was saying, I think uh, businesses right now are turning to the CDC, which has traditionally been the source for information of how to keep yourself safe. Um, and, but the, the granularity of that data is not enough for most people. And um, Nick, who I unfairly, um, whose company I unfairly um, uh, uh, smeared before, I, I didn't mean that in, in any way. Okay. Nick's, very, Nick's, very, Nick's very concerned about keeping his employees healthy. When the next test comes out that says you have an 80% chance of being protected against disease, how does Nick, uh, how does Snap-on use that information? It's very specific to Snap-on. It's not general for everybody. And the CDC can't tell him how to do it. They can say, here is the general, um, uh, general framework. And I think going back to the idea that was raised uh, uh, by, by, by Mandel and, 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 and expanded on by Arnie, building not only occupational health, but public health within businesses helps reinforce its importance. Not, not only does it make it better for easier for the business, but helps reinforce its importance and, and might, might buffer that lag that you're talking about, Melissa. Um, I, I think that the other thing is to make it clear, is to clearly communicate the fact that this isn't our last outbreak. As bad as this one is, um, we've had a coronavirus uh, like this every 10 years now. Um, there will be another coronavirus, there will be another flu outbreak, there'll be something. Um, and uh, to pretend that it isn't going to happen and just or hope that it doesn't happen is just not, it's just poor planning. And I think, again, we need to communicate that fact. And if I can just jump in for a second, I think we also have to recognize that there are other important um, health concerns, some have even labeled them as epidemics, that matter for business, the economy, and productivity are our chronic disease concerns of obesity and um, diabetes and hypertension. Um, you know, companies will be better off if they address these health concerns of their employees. And I think people that lead companies understand that. And, you know, not only in terms of the costs of health care, but also in terms of uh, you'd rather have a You'd rather prevent these problems and have a healthy, productive workforce. So I think the more we can break down these silos, um, uh, you know, one silver lining perhaps of COVID is, is, you know, this growing recognition that we're all in it together and that different people bring dif different expertise to the table, but that we, we actually need to integrate and we need to work together and that, um, you know, it's not just uh, a governmental enterprise, public health. It is about trying to uh, improve health, prevent disease, and basically uh, strengthen society and the world we live in. You know, look, Peggy, you make a really good point about needing um, to work together. And I think that's part of it. And I think to do that effectively, I think we need to make some modifications in how we think about the federal role in public health. I mean, as I mentioned early, federal communication has been in, in, inconsistent, and I think it needs to be more, but I can imagine functions like the feds having a public health IT system so that they can monitor demand and supply across the country. And I can see feds taking over and doing what happened in a piecemeal way where if there's real trouble in New York and Washington is doing great, they move some machinery there and they have the ability to do that. And I can also see them getting more resources and not being so under-resourced and having a natural buildup that they were in charge of for pandemics and the like. Can I just add something? Can I just, okay, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Nick. Go ahead, Nick. Go ahead. I was just going to add something. A couple of things. I have a perspective on this is that I would suggest, I heard this in a conference before, that the Lars Anderson Bridge between the Harvard Yard and the Square and the Business School might as well be the Sahara Desert. Because people think of the Business School, I think on the other side of the river in a certain way. And in fact, to hear it there, you heard it today, I think we have to assert, business has to keep asserting 
that we're interested in the welfare of our people, not just investors. All business knows that. But the second thing I want to talk about, I heard today, people talk about profit versus health. That's not it. To make a pedestrian example, I think people want to buy, are more anxious about buying a roll of toilet paper than they are of the next analysis. And that toilet paper was vended by the grocery clerk and delivered by the truck driver whose truck got managed or put on the road by a technician and that was produced by a factory worker. It isn't, it isn't about profit. It is about the avoiding of the disintegration of our society under risk. Keeping these people uh, safe is that important. And I think the public health group, I mean, I think business has to understand that they have to cooperate with people and understand that it isn't just shareholders, but I think the public health group also has to realize that it is in business interest and it isn't just about profit, it's about the maintenance of society. And I think that that's part, I think that's a really, really good point. I think we've seen um, what, what I've described as the broader ESG movement uh, that, you know, as we all know, is, is not new in terms of the importance uh, of it or, or folks talking about it in concept, I'd imagine, uh, that there's been you know, about 30 years of podium fodder about the importance of sustainability. But I would argue that the last three or four years, uh, something has happened. And I think it is, I think it is incredibly different. I'm, de- I'm surely seeing it uh, at my firm, and we're not uh, by any means uh, unique on this front. Uh, Larry Fink and others have been out front talking about uh, how essential it is to, to, um, to uh, the business. And Frankly, our clients are starting to demand it. And, and one of the things that you want to get financial institutions to move, I mean, you, you want to you know, you get the clients to uh, get ahead of them. And that's surely been uh, the case. And we established an institute on sustainability about 10 years ago, and our CEO chairs it. And it's, just, it's amazing to see how it's now, um, it's touching every single aspect of our overall uh, ecosystem, which uh, we're excited about. And I, I still believe we're in the early innings on, on this front. And something that Peggy mentioned about um, just how essential this all is, and, and she's 100% correct. I mean, you would think that we would have had a chief medical officer, you know, you know, decades ago for, for a whole host of obvious reasons, meaning the business, the most important assets going up and down the elevators every day as the old adage goes. But one area that I'd add to the list is mental health. And I've been extraordinarily proud of the organization in terms of how we've been leaning in against that. And it's an area that we all know, you know, uh, used to be associated, a negative stigma used to be associated with it. And I've really been proud of the organization in terms of how serious we're now uh, taking it. But again, a heck of a lot more to do. Um, I do want to get to questions from our viewers, and we've got a lot of questions about vaccines. Eric, I want to ask you about an article in the New York Times just today about a British lab at Imperial College of London forming a special partnership that would effectively sidestep the drug industry um, to uh, manufacture vaccines without profits or licensing fees. We should note that the partnership would be um, with Morningside Ventures, which is founded by the Chan family, which is a major donor to the T.H. Chan School of Public Health at Harvard. But efforts like this theoretically could get the vaccine out there faster and more cheaply to not only Britain, um, but also to uh, less fortunate countries. I think this is uh, a a great announcement, and it's one of several in the vaccine area in general, vaccines that are important for global health. It really gets to the question, not just of cost and not just of speed, because industry can produce things fast and industry can produce things um, uh, 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 well, and and they uh, oftentimes tr- uh, can charge. They can charge low uh, prices for things if it's very important. Um, but the question is, who's going to get the vaccine, and and how is how are we going to equitably distribute uh, treatment, not just vaccines, but treatments? Um, and that is going to be an issue. I, I think um, it's going to be an issue within our country, and it's going to be an issue globally because this is not just a U.S. disease. It's it's all over the world. The largest outbreaks right now are happening in South America, um, not, not no longer in the US. Uh, we're all gonna be facing more of it. So um, uh, how do we do this fairly? And I think, you know, I commend the people at Imperial and at Morningside for taking that on. 
Um, here's another question. Peggy, I think this might be a good one for you. Um, how can public health still develop its full potential as an entity separate and distinct from the political realm? It does appear these days that perhaps some organizations um, might give guidance and might be influenced by politics. Well, that is such a key question, and I have spent most of my career working at the sort of perilous interface between science, medicine, public health, and politics, um, since most of my, um, my professional life has been in, in government service. Um, you know, I feel very strongly that, that public health needs to be true to the science and the data. It needs to be able to speak truth to power. It needs to recognize that its um, information for decision-making is going to enter a broader sphere where there will be um, politics and competing priorities and other things. But, but the, the, Public health practice needs to, you know, adhere as close as it can to the best possible science and um, and really be uh, data driven. And it has been, I think, disturbing during our response to um, this novel coronavirus uh, to see some of the tensions between politics and science and public health playing out, I think it's been encouraging that the public seems to really want to listen to the experts and really does want to hear from the scientists and public health professionals. They really do look to um, advances in science and public health practice um, to help guide them on the path forward. Um, you know, it is, it can be hard. I had a fairly unique experience as New York City Health Commissioner of being appointed first by Mayor Dinkins, the first African American mayor, and in fact, sadly, the only African American mayor of New York City, but I was kept on by Mayor Giuliani. So I had three years under both. And um, I really did try to run the health department and offer public health advice um, and undertake public health programs uh, in the same way, despite the change in who was in um, City Hall. In fact, I once said to Mayor Giuliani, which I don't think he appreciated, that I felt I would do my job in the same way, whether there was a Republican, a Democrat, or a chimpanzee in, the, the, in City Hall. Um, when he was, you know, sort of questioning the loyalty of, of certain people who had been um, hired or promoted during the Dinkins years. Um, but, but I think that is absolutely crucial and the value of public health comes from people being able to have trust and confidence in the recommendations and the information that they provide. Um, Eric, I want to go back to you. You had mentioned in your opening remarks that different communities get information differently. And, and so I'm wondering if, uh, if you think as we start thinking about public health and how we can um, cement its role, uh, you know, in, in business and, and also in, in the public's mindset, um, how we can make sure that this information gets to the various communities. Because what we've learned uh, from this particular pandemic is that it, it has hit uh, people of color disproportionately economically as well as uh, in terms of infection rates. So there seems to be um, a, a need in particular to reach out to those communities in terms of information. I think you put it exactly right. It's the reaching out part. I think that um, traditionally, at least in my um, in, 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 in my position as a medical journal editor, we put things out there and then we wait for people to grab them. And uh, we, we hope that the right people see them and we hope that they get picked up by someone. Obviously, we want, our, our, we want to be, have an impact. We're, trying, we're out there trying to make a difference in health and health care. Um, but I think we need to be a little more proactive in searching out those methods of communication that make sense for different communities. Um, we can always call up the New York Times, well, we don't call it the New York Times, we, we kind of wait around for them to call us, or MSNBC or, or other media uh, members, but are we doing it the right way? 
Um, are we reaching out to the communities that we want to reach out to? I, I think the answer is probably no. And I think the, uh, it's really on us to be doing more about that. Yeah, Arnie, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I um, think about that a lot because I do my work in the policy at the theater. And the goal here for the kind of work I do is to get it into, to translate it into real world practice. And so we spend a lot of time working with that. And as part of it, publication is just the start of, of what we're going to communicate, not the end of what we're going to communicate. So it involves getting to know and being intimate with people in government. I spent four years there myself, and part of that was to understand that interaction backwards and, and forwards and how, how those could come together. And there are professional meetings, but there's a lot of informal contact. And I think there's general recognition within the people who run foundations in the policy world that part of what the effort is, is dissemination okay. and translation. Right. Translation of particular, I mean, you guys are talking about technical information. This is very technical information. Um, we're just about out of time. We've got five minutes left um, and uh, sort of, you know, not instead of takeaways, but, uh, you know, I wanted to go to our business leaders. Mendel, what do you need? We're still, you know, coming out of this pandemic. What, what do you need from public health at this point? What would you like to hear now? Yeah, like I think the uh, at, a, at a macro level and as a, a citizen of the, the country, I, I, I truly wish for, uh, for, for, for them to, for the platform afforded to our, our public officials to be uh, one that is uh, consistent, uh, where they're allowed to be as transparent uh, as they can be. So obviously, just as a human level, as a husband, as a father, you know, you just want to make sure that you get the facts. And I I agree with the point that you know it's, this has been politicized a bit, which is which is uh, incredibly disappointing. And I think the point that was just talked about taking the technical aspects of uh, all the complexity that's around uh, you know uh, COVID nineteen and other related you know issues that we deal with in public health and and put it in a very snackable, digestible way uh, for um, for our people. I think that that's just extraordinarily uh, important. And then lastly, I think the effort to continue to modernize our public health ecosystem, right? It still feels like it's a paper print facts uh, ecosystem and continuing to move towards one that's truly modernized um, uh, for a whole host of obvious uh, reasons. But those are the things that jump out uh, to me top of mind. Yeah. Nick, how about you? What, what do you still need um, from public health in order to, you know, really fully um, not just get your business going because you've been operating the whole time, but in order to reopen the economy fully? I, I, I see it this way. I, I don't think it's so much involved with reopening the economy. I think it's preparing for the future, at least from my perspective. I see the, the evolution of this situation as, or the, the periods as shock. Everybody's shocked. A combination, you figure out how to pursue your life under the threat, and then psychological recovery, you get confidence in the future. And reinforcing the confidence of the future says you have to be prepared for the shocks of the future. You know, one day I'm at the Milwaukee Bucks game, and the next morning I'm shaking 600 hands in a ballroom, and a day after I'm hearing about shelter in place, shock. So I need to have, I, I think I would like to have from public health, the ways in which I could prepare my businesses, and actually all businesses, big and small. Remember, 98% uh, of manufacturers are less than 500 people, and they don't have a lot of resources. They need advice, and we need to help prepare them so that when the shock comes next, when all the damage is done, they get over that with not so much damage. That's what's needed. Yeah, and certainly there have been a lot of lessons learned so far in this pandemic, Peggy, but there's still a long way to go. So in terms of what you think public health can do to help business, to help society and the economy, where would you like to see public health step up? Well, as we, Noted earlier, you know, this is the time for public health to really uh, define itself, why it matters, and to, to really um, get both the resources and the respect that it really deserves. But as, as we do that, there does need to be reform. I couldn't agree with Mandel more that it is time for public health to modernize. It is um, a system that has, you know, sort of been evolved over now the course of our nation's history, 
it, it is a, a fragmented um, system. In fact, a lot of public health actually happens at the state and local level, you know, by law. Um, but we have a lot of, you know, very small health departments that don't really have capacity. We don't have good communication and interoperability. We do need to get out of the paper era um, using uh, much more modern IT. And we have to become full partners with all the different um, sectors that matter for health, that can benefit from the expertise and, and perspectives of public health, but we also need to understand, you know, much more deeply about the world in which public health needs to do its important work and how, you know, we really can do it all in it together. And I think it is, it is not just about responding to the current crisis, as Nick said, it is about preparing for the future. And Arnie, what should we be thinking about as we look forward to the future, even as we're climbing out of this pandemic, but that's been the theme, right? It's not just this one, we have to prepare for the next one. So what should we be doing right now, whether you're in business or you're in public health? So I'd say there are two things. One is we shouldn't forget the really important lessons that Dean Williams started with, that this has been a terrible problem for certain groups, minority, lower SES groups, and we, we can't forget that. And before this, we leave this amphitheater. We should take advantage of this, not quite a golden moment, it's just the opposite, a, a moment of sort of natural sadness that we have this problem, but not forget it and go ahead and work on coverage and social determinants, um, safety net hospitals, and the cultural things that we need to do. And then on the other side, the learn lesson I pick up is that we're, we're, we're in the country with 5% of the people of the world's population. We should have had 1% of the infections if we had a good system, not 30%. That's, and we can't do that. So I call on all of us collectively to think about how we working with business because they're, they're going to be independent, can do better going forward. Yeah. Eric? Um, I'm going to end on a somewhat optimistic note, an unrealistically optimistic note. Um, this is this is horrible. Um, this has been a disaster, but it has brought the importance of public health to the fore. And I hope that it can be the catalyst to remind everybody uh, of what other people have said, and particularly Peggy talking about um, non-communicable diseases, uh, Nick talking about occupational health. All of these issues are should be embedded. We should have a healthier population. We should have a healthier workforce. Um, and they should be embedded in our culture. Um, and we're not there. And maybe this is an opportunity to show how important that is. I like that optimism. Thank you guys so much. There's a lot to think about from this event. Um, the conversation will continue, by the way, on June 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern, where my colleague from MSNBC, Stephanie Rule, will moderate part three of When Public Health Means Business with Lauren Summers, the present emeritus and Charles W. Elliott University professor at Harvard. Thank you, panelists, Meg Peggy Hamburg, Eric Rubin, Nick Pinchuk, Arnie Epstein, and Mendel Crowley. And of course, our thanks to Dean Michelle Williams and the T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thanks for joining us all. Have a great day.